Hello everyone, I'm Eli. And I'm Max. And this is Targum T, a podcast which focuses on pop culture reviews and social media. In today's episode, we will be talking about the new Amazon Prime movie, One Night in Miami. Warning, this review contains spoilers. All right, so One Night in Miami is directed by first-time director Regina King uh, and is written by Kemp Powers and is based on the play that Kemp Powers also wrote. And it is a fictional account of One Night uh, in Miami, where icons uh, Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, Sam Cooke, and Jim Brown gathered and discussed their roles um, in the civil rights movement and their roles as Black leaders in positions of power. So where do we want to start off on this review? Because um, I really, really enjoyed this movie. I think there's a lot of, you know, talking points and ways that we can go with it. But I, I think I thought it would start it off by just saying that this is one of those movies where you can pinpoint every like uh, actor in this movie is just so amazing. Like all the performances are just off the charts. And I'm curious to get your opinion about what you thought about all of the performances. I was just impressed, first of all, by Eli Gorey's uh, performance of uh, Cassius Clay. I'm going to call him Cassius for the rest of this because that's what he was called before. The before end of- Muhammad Ali. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, like his like little accent, like the Kentucky accent, like get in the ring, like just every little thing I loved from him. It was funny. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, he was amazing. I, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it was, uh, Kingsley Ben Adir who plays Malcolm X and then Aldous Hodge plays Jim Brown. Yeah. Uh, Cassie's Clay was Eli, Go- Eli Gowry. And then, uh, Sam Cooke is played by Leslie Odom Jr. Who some people might know from Hamilton, the Hamilton play, uh, yeah, I mean, they were all fantastic. Eli Gorey as Cassius Clay was so good, especially in those beginning scenes um, where he, he's obviously uh, in, you know, boxing scenes. Um, and he, he does look the role of Muhammad Ali. If you look at old pictures, yeah. everyone in this movie kind of looks like their character, which is always great. Leslie um, Jr. looked like just like uh J- Sam Cooke. Like- just like Sam Cooke. It was, it was it, right down to like the way that he sang uh, his numbers like if you look at old footage of Sam Cooke it's like to a T it's like yeah. exactly the way that he did it yeah, this um, perfect yeah no it was great and I really like the dynamic between all four of the characters um, I'm, I'm curious to get your opinion on that because you know it, it was hard for me when I finished to kind of pick a standout I guess I would probably say Leslie Odom as Sam Cooke just because I'm partial to Sam Cooke because um, he's one of my favorite singers and uh, you know, I've, I've always loved to go through his work and just listen to him. But um, uh, I mean, what do you think of kind of the power dynamic between all of the characters in this film? I liked how in the beginning it felt like Malcolm had like this presence over them. Like he was this figure that they should respect. But, you know, like Sam Cooke, like obviously he had his reservations about uh, Malcolm, like from the beginning. But like it started, of, it sort of turns like like around the middle of the movie where we're kind of questioning like Malcolm's morals, like should we be believing what he's telling us? Uh, like the other characters start losing faith in him. Uh, but like, it seems to all come around like towards the end, like they they come to some sort of understanding, like it, n- none of them like need, aren't doing anything uh, that's like bad for the movement the civil rights movement, but uh, like they could all be doing things differently in certain ways that they haven't thought about yet. Yeah, a hundred percent. And uh, to go off that point a little bit, um, just so people know, this is, you know, four very prominent uh, black figures. And this is, you know, taking place in the 1960s uh, when, you know, United States is going through like a cultural upheaval, um, you know, in terms of civil rights and gay rights and everything that's going on at the time. And if you look at all of the individuals in this, Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown, Sam Cooke, they all play um, very different but very powerful role, uh, very powerful roles, roles in that movement, right? And I think it's interesting where they kind of explore how each of them contributed to the movement, and they that's kind of where the conflict comes from in the movie uh, with Malcolm X, who you know is obviously at that time he's the leader of the Muslim brotherhood um and at that time he's also um starting to splinter off from them um and one of the conflicts in the movie is between him and uh 
um, Eli Gori at Cassie's Clay, um, who wants to uh, become a Muslim and who's been convinced to become a Muslim by Malcolm X. And so there's a little conflict between them where, you know, Cassie's Clay is trying to figure out, you know, does he definitely want to go that route? Um, he's getting pushback from Jim Brown and Sam Cooke, who are not, you know, really religious at all. And they have their kind of own reservations about Malcolm X and the whole, you know, movement itself. And I thought what was interesting is that whole conflict that's just created from, especially uh, Malcolm X and Sam Cooke, where it's this whole idea of like, what is your role as a uh, black figure who has power in the 1960s? Because that's kind of like almost like the thesis of the movie. It's, yeah, you know, I, think, I think what ties all of these figures together in the movie is that they all have these like different degrees of fame and what they do with that fame is entirely up to them and, and they have to decide within themselves like if what they're doing is for themselves or for something bigger and it might not matter but it might um, right yeah it, it reminded me um there's this one scene with Cassius uh by the pool where he's talking to his manager or something I think uh telling him that uh you know he can't do certain things because he's black um, it reminded me of the scene from Introducing Dorothy Dandridge. Have you seen that? The TV movie? No. Halle Berry's in it. She's playing a, a Dorothy Dandridge, who is supposed to star as Carmen Jones in this big musical coming up. And she's by the pool with her manager and they're telling her, you know, she's the big star of this movie. They're, they're like all at her feet and, and she's still not allowed to go in the pool or use the casino or the restaurant. Like they all have this fame and this notoriety, but to some degree, they can't use any of it. They have to use it like undercover. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting because I mean, kind of the whole point it seems like is uh, like, how do they use their power? How do they use their influence um, when there's varying degrees of, of like, how do we, how do we handle our, our roles while also trying to be, you know, distinct people, um, especially with, I think Sam Cooke uh, because he's, you know, with Sam Cooke at the time, he's trying to become this, you know, this bigger singer. They talk about his relation to people like Bob Dylan, who comes out with uh, Blown in the Wind, um, you know, a year before. I think it's a year or two before. And they even reference the, um, the song within the movie. And one of the things that Malcolm X says is that um, Sam Cooke hasn't made a song like that. He hasn't made a song that really focuses on like, the struggles of the black community. And then here we have Bob Dylan, who's a white man, who's, you know, talking about the struggles of equality and, the sh and you know, the struggles of the black community better than Sam Cooke. Yeah. And that kind of becomes like its own, you know, uh, um, question. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which I thought was interesting. Yeah. I, yeah. It seemed like it's, it's easier to, you know, commentate on something like the civil rights movement when you're, you know, a white person from the outside commenting in on it. It's harder for Sam Cooke, who has to like make his way as a black man. He can't release certain music or he won't uh, get certain, uh, you know, leverage or appreciation from the music community. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's with all the characters too, because I mean, they even talk about how Jim Brown, he wants to make a um, transition from the NFL to acting. Mm -hmm. um, at that time. And uh, Cassius Clay basically tells him, you know, the reason that you are in a position of power right now is because of the NFL. And it's because you're like one of the best players in the NFL. Um, and, you know, that kind of makes you a, a leader and everything. And he says, uh, if you go into the movies, you're going to become, and he basically says this, he's going to, you're going to become the, the black guy that dies halfway into the movie black exploitation type thing exactly and 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 he also says like you know what would be the point of that because you're kind of on top of the world right now and everything yeah. reminds um, me of one part of the movie malcolm x says to jim you are our greatest weapons and then jim says i'm nobody's weapon like he's not a tool to be used for the black community he's just trying to make his way he wants to do acting he'll do acting yeah yeah exactly i mean the there seems to be that whole question of the individual versus, you know, like what, what the roles have to be, I guess. Cause I, th I think it's important to understand too, that 
you know, Malcolm X, uh, uh, Jim Brown, Sam, all these guys have, you know, like biographies made about them. Like you can watch the movie Ali, which is about Muhammad Ali, where Will Smith plays him. You can, you can watch Malcolm X, uh, which is like a three hour biopic that Spike Lee did. And you'll get an idea, you'll get a better idea of who they were um, as people. And it's within, you know, 20 years of their lives or something like that. But in this movie, it's, you know, it's just one night and it isn't so much about highlighting, you know, who they were throughout their whole life. It's about highlighting what their kind of ideals meant and then how their ideals kind of influenced each other, which, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. I also, wa- I wanted to get your opinion too on uh, how this all takes place essentially in one location for most of the movie. What, what, what did you think of that? Yeah. I mean, I've been kind of wrestling with that in my mind, like if I actually think this works on a like a movie level like it definitely feels like it was a play that was put to screen like kind of like Fences was um you know there's like 30 minutes of setup we we get to meet all the characters and then after that it's kind of just conversations until the last last like 20 minutes um which I'm not complaining about I, I there was never like a a drop in the pacing like it was it was still really entertaining and great to watch but I don't know if I would say it worked as like a, a film um, the way like something like Moonlight does, which was also adapted from a play. It feels more like a movie and less like a play. Yeah, I love Moonlight. And when you just mentioned Fences, that's the first thing that I thought of when I saw this movie, because Fences was a play, I want to say from like 2007 or something like that. Is that, yeah. is that right? Or I mean, it was a play, definitely. But yeah. Um, and then I think that was directed also by uh, Denzel Washington, right? Yeah. And that was his first time directing a movie. Yeah, same kind of thing there. With Regina King, exactly. It, yeah, it's, it's interesting because what you were just saying about, you don't know if the whole thing kind of works. That's kind of what I was thinking originally where I was like, I can't tell if like, because I'm like, I was like, I, I'm really entertained by everything that's going on. Um, and I'm really uh, enthralled by like the dialogue and everything and the performances, but it is one of those things where, because it's in one location, it's not like this is a fast moving movie. You know, mm-hmm. essentially what it is, is just four guys talking in a hotel room um, yeah. and they move other places now and then. I think that's what makes it a good film on its own is because uh, it is just in this one location, but you see how Regina King had to, you know, use the camera and use staging to uh, to make it interesting the entire time. Like there's there's shots and ways to film the scene that you couldn't do in, in just a play. Um, so I think she elevates it in that way. Kind of like, like when you're watching 12 Angry Men, it's just a bunch of guys in a room talking, but like it, it's, it's interesting the whole time and the director keeps it interesting. Yeah, 12 Angry Men is, is great too, because like you just said, it's, it's filmed in one room, but it's also, uh, what Cindy Lumet uh, or Cindy Lumet does with that movie um, uh, is, you know, keep the shots like super, super close on people where it becomes claustrophobic. And in this film, there's something kind of similar that Regina King does where um, I I was kind of interested to see like what type of tools that she would utilize as a director. Uh, And she blocks and stages uh, when they're inside the hotel, very interestingly, where the camera is always very subtly moving. I, and I don't know if you noticed that it's it's a very subtle thing. It, it's like whenever they're actually talking in the hotel room, the shots are really never stationary. They're always like kind of moving in some way. And I thought that was cool because it because it kind of reflects the conversation that they're having, especially when things start to get heated, right? Between uh, Malcolm X and Sam Cooke, that's when yeah. things kind of become a little more chaotic. And so she can kind of shift the the camera around and everything. But uh, I mean. Yeah, I mean, commenting more on what she does as a director, did anything else kind of stand out to you, like technique-wise? Or, um, I was, in one of the first scenes, I was kind of blown away by the the lighting and the cinematography and the scene with uh, Jim Brown. I think he's in like Georgia or something or his hometown, um, talking to a, a man that lives in his hometown. And he's saying how proud he is of Jim and like how great he is. And I was like, wow, this is just so beautifully shot. And I was like, it's almost too beautifully shot. And then right at the end of the scene, 
he says, yeah, we don't let your kind in the house. And, and it just kind of like fell like a ton of bricks on the scene. Like it was so sweet and like well done. And then it was just like, oh, wow, that was perfect. Got yeah. Did you, did you get the feeling in that scene? I, Cause it, so in this scene, it's uh, Jim Brown, who's talking to, um, I, I don't remember who they say he actually is. I, I don't know if you remember, but He's talking to this white guy and, you know, this is taking place um, in Georgia, do they say? I think it's his hometown, which is like an island off of Georgia. Okay. Yeah. And, and he's talking to this guy outside of his house. And I, I kind of got the feeling that this guy was like sketchy. <laughs> like immediately I was like, there's something. I'm waiting for something to happen. Yeah. I was like, there's something because you could tell just by the way he was saying things. I was like, they're kind of framing it where it sounds like he's going to kind of unleash some type of like line or whatever, which does end up happening. And, and yeah. I, I think that scene is interesting too, just cause it, uh, it kind of sets up the, the theme of this movie, which is that Jim Brown, or it, Jim Brown is one of the characters who deals with this, but he, uh, he's kind of only thought of as this, you know, incredible football player or whatever. And that's why white people will like him or whatever. But at the same time, it's also him realizing that he is still black and he has to deal with the consequences of, you know, racist, <laughs> essentially, right. of that time. Separating yeah. individual from the collective, yeah. Exactly, yeah. And, and you're right, the cinematography in that scene, it was almost like dreamlike to the, to the point where it's like um, they have that shot where it's, uh, it's the two of them backdropped against the window or whatever. And it's like the sunlight is pooling in through the window. And I was like, wow, that it feels just like a dream almost yeah. like what's going to go wrong here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I thought that was a cool way to set it up. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I was going to say, uh, what did you think about the fact that this is obviously a fictional account of, you know, these four figures who there is accounts of them meeting up and talking, but, Obviously, we don't know what could have been said in those close quarter meetings that they had. Um, so this is basically Kemp Powers kind of interpreting what he thought that they might have talked about and everything. So what do you think of kind of the nonfiction elements kind of reimagined as fictional elements? Um, I, I thought it was very well done because you kind of get the sense that they have these, you know, friendly personal relationships that you know, obviously, I don't know, I don't know how much is written about it, but I don't know how much we know about their personal relationships. It felt very, very real. Um, and then also combining that with the historical elements, like they're referencing things that are going on, but also talking about each other on a personal level. I thought it was just melded together really well, uh, like in the service of discussing, you know, the civil rights movement and their role in it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it was kind of interesting to just hear where their uh, dialogue was going to go in general, because I actually, I didn't know that Cassius Clay, the reason that he became Muhammad Ali, uh, in large part did have to do with uh, Malcolm X. You know, obviously that, that friendship and everything like is true. I looked that up afterward just because I was curious about, you know, how much of this movie was definitely true. Um, I, I don't know like too much about the stuff about how Jim Brown and Sam Cooke factor into it. Um, I don't doubt that they probably, you know, all did have conversations and everything, but yeah, I, uh, I, I feel like the least important part of this movie is the fact that it's the four of them who are um, kind of talking in this hotel room about, I don't know, just, just about each other's personal lives. Like, I feel like that's kind of like the least important part of this movie I feel like the more important parts are about them discussing like how their personal lives kind of fit into the, you know, the civil rights movement uh, as a whole, essentially, because they each kind of have to grapple with that. Um, and, and I mean, those parts are true that that obviously is based off of, you know, real life. So I like how Kemp Powers kind of uses the historical events as sort of like a stepping stone for what their conversations could have been like. Because I don't doubt, I mean, it probably did go this way, I, I would think, because Malcolm X, that was kind of his personality, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, like apart from this, I, you know, I don't know a lot about these people. They're just kind of these icons that I know their names, but I don't know who they are. Um, so I feel like it did a good job of 
of getting me to feel like I knew these people. No, yeah, I agree. I mean, again, if you want to watch like things about uh, like in-depth readings on their lives and everything, I mean, there's like tons of stuff that, you know, you can read and write about, but it's really, it's really besides the point, it feels like in a movie like this, where it is more about what they would have talked about and how, you know, it would have coalesced in something that meant something to the black movement of that time. Um, and what they meant is as prominent figures. And that's also a good lead into um, my question of what is your favorite scene in this movie? Because mine is the ending scene um, where it's the uh, four characters who they've all left the hotel and everything. And uh, it kind of shows where they go off in the next like couple of weeks or whatever. And that whole storyline with Sam Cook um, kind of reaches that uh, um, that um, focal point or whatever, where he sings um, A Change Is Gonna Come, which is obviously becomes his most famous single and uh, one of the most famous and important songs of the civil rights movement. And it shows like the footage of the other, uh, of Malcolm X and Jim Brown um, uh, after the events that just took place with him singing over it. I thought that scene was extremely powerful and well done. I feel like Sam Cooke was like the emotional core of this movie. Um, and my favorite scene was when he was, Malcolm's telling the story about him up on stage where the mic's broken and he sings the uh, chain gang uh, with the audience. And that just like gave me chills. Like watching that scene, I could just feel that. Oh, I love that scene too. When, when that happened to I that was the other thing I wanted to know if that was based on a true story, like yeah, that yeah, part that, that he says, because that's awesome if that really did happen. Because in that scene, it's basically Sam Cooke, who uh, his mic cuts out while he's in like a concert or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, he just has to get the stadium riled up by having them um, uh, like clap their hands. And, you know, he, he kind of creates the music with the people, essentially. Um, that, yeah, that scene was awesome as well. I, I thought the same. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, the other important aspect of this movie, and I'm curious to get your opinion. Did you, uh, have you seen like Green Book and like The Help? Have you seen, yeah, seen those I was, movies? I was going to see if you want to talk about that. Uh, yeah. Green Book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm just curious in your perspective, because I think one of the problems with movies that have come out over the past like 10 years or so that have to do with the civil rights movement is that there seems to be like um this message at all of them where it's like racism is bad and yeah. like i don't know yay yeah exactly and it's like ah, like I, I i liked green book i thought it was like a pretty good movie but i just the message of it was just so like it was yeah. just kind of dumb because it's like we know racism is bad like whereas like this movie in relation to that feels so much like it feels so much more genuine because it's actually about race in general it's not about you know like oh racism is bad you know <laughs> no, like white savior in this movie and yeah when it's over nothing feels really resolved it's just it's asking the audience questions and asking you know themselves questions that can't be answered and it just leaves you thinking unlike something like green book where you leave feeling like everything's great and warm and fuzzy. I, I get the impression that you didn't like Green Book, I'm guessing, right? Uh, I mean, well, I actually did enjoy Green Book. Uh, uh, it, was, it was entertaining, it was, it was genuinely funny, uh, but like the message of the movie just didn't hit for me. And it just felt very cookie cutter ending by the end of it. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's the same thing with the help too, where it's like, when you get those movies where it's like you just said with the white savior and those are also from white directors as well, which I think makes a difference. This is, this movie is coming from, you know, two black figures in Kemp Powers and Regina King. Um, and I mean, that's a whole nother discussion, but I, I think that's important, especially here where it actually feels like there's a conversation going on. That's important. Like I, I made a note of this where I could definitely see this being a movie that uh, they, um, that you show in like high schools and middle schools and stuff like that. Uh, because it is one of those movies where I think everyone should see it because it is a really important discussion about race. And we didn't even really get into like how that ties into today. But I mean, obviously I, I think more importantly today isn't to have a message where it's like racism is bad because at this point, 
you know, everyone knows that racism uh, is bad. And if you don't know that, then I, I don't even know. But, <laughs> but, I, but I think it is more important, honestly, to just have conversations about race and, you know, the prominence of Black figures, which is, which is to me, you know, that is kind of the most important thing. Yeah, like, in, I remember growing up in school, we would watch movies like The Help uh, for the same reasons, but I would never show The Help or Green Book in schools today. Um, to teach about racism. Exactly. I mean, if you were to show something else, like if you were to show a double feature with this, I, I mean, I, yeah. I was trying to think Mo Moonlight probably. Yeah, you could do, or you could do like something like this or Moonlight plus the help and then afterwards have like discussions about what they thought about the messages of both of those movies. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, yeah, and, and again, it's just the message of this, which I, I, I think just kind of, makes it more powerful and more of a reason why you would show this in, in high schools and middle schools and stuff. But, uh, uh, but yeah, as far as like overall impressions, um, uh, how would you rate this movie? We usually do it on a scale of one to five teacups, five teacups being, you know, best movie ever type thing or whatever. Uh, wh what would you give it? I really like this movie. I would watch it again. I think it has a lot to say. Um, I'm going to give it four out of five teacups. Nice. That's a... <laughs> It's a very good rating. I, I mean, I would probably give it probably right there, like 3.5 teacups, between 3.5 and 4, I would say. Um, I think this is a really, really, really fascinating and good movie. Um, it has great performances. Uh, the screenplay by Kent Powers is just immaculate, and the dialogue is just crisp and fun and everything. I, I would say my only negative about it is that it is kind of static for a little bit while, for a little while in the movie. But I, again, I think that just kind of does make the scenes later a little more powerful. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm right there with you. I think it was a really good movie and I think everyone should watch it, you know? Yeah. Okay, well, I think that should wrap it up. Join us next time on uh, Targum T for more reviews and make sure to follow the Daily Targum on our Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube for more content. Mm -hmm.